Good morning. Welcome to the Father's house. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to give God our best praise today. Amen. Let's put our hands together and let's worship him this morning. A praise awaits you with the dawn. Our souls awake to you and lift a song. We've seen the things that you have done, and still we know the best is yet to come. There's more to come. Sometimes we can come in and we sing, sing these songs and we just sing them without even thinking, especially if we really know the song or maybe we really just like the song and man, that's my jam. But we don't really put thought to the words that are coming out of our mouth. But today, as we sing these words, I pray that every single person's attention is on the words that are coming out of your mouth. Because as the prayer team said this morning, it will be like a direct um, uh, language from God to you. That it's a direct message from God to you this morning and reminding you of who he is. You know, we can come in, can I just be honest today? Can we just get real and raw and honest? Yeah. 
I don't always feel like standing up here. I don't always feel like getting up on Sunday morning and putting on a smile and leading you in worship, much less lead my own self. And you might be in that place today, and I want you to know that that's okay. And I want you to know that you and I, we're the same. Just like sometimes you don't wanna sing, sometimes I really don't wanna sing. But can I tell you this, can I direct your attention to the one of whom is worthy of our singing? Just because I don't feel like it doesn't mean, pastor, what you, you posted this this week. It doesn't mean that I follow after my feelings. And my feelings don't dictate who God is. And just because I may not feel him in the moment doesn't mean that he is not here. Just because I may feel chaotic on the inside doesn't mean that he does not bring peace. Because he does. Just because things may be going crazy all around me doesn't mean that God is not still in control. Because he is. Because he is sovereign. So this morning, maybe you're in that place. And maybe right now in this moment, before we even begin to sing another word, you want to just throw your hands up in the air. And maybe you just want to say a little breath prayer to him and say, you know what, God, Uh, I I don't feel it right now, but I'm not going to follow my feelings this morning. I'm going to follow knowing that you are true and that the truth of your word says that you are God and that nothing and no one can change who you are. Your character is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And I will not follow after my feelings. I will follow after you, and I will set my eyes as a flint on you, God. And I will be focused on you because you are worthy, God. You are 100% worthy. You speak and waters crash upon the sand The oceans push and pull at your command You hold the moon and stars within your hands And all with just a nobody like you God there's nobody like you God and there will never be i mm-hmm. 
all of our attention, all of our worship is on you this morning. And Father, we want to join in with the heavenly song that's going on from since before time began far into eternity. We want to join in with the angels today and we want to sing out holy, 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 holy are you God.
All 
It doesn't matter if we acknowledge that it's his. It doesn't change it. He still gets all glory. So we can choose whether we want to join in with that or not. But it's not going to diminish the fact that it all belongs to him. And what a privilege it gives us the choice to li- and the ability to physically lift our hands. Some people didn't walk in here on two legs. Some people are missing limbs, but we are, many of us are physically able to offer praise. And how often do we not give all that we have? So I challenge you in this moment to lift your voice and praise him because, not because you feel like it, but because he just deserves it and he's gonna get the glory whether or not we give it to him. Let's sing this again. All glory and honor, dominion and power to you. All wisdom and wonder belong to no other but you. Let's sing it again. All glory and honor, dominion and power to you. Lift your hands as you worship Him. All wisdom and wonder belong to no other but you. Just the voices as we end it. Oh, glory and honor, dominion and power to you. Oh, wisdom and wonder belong to no other but you thank you you, lord thank you lord for the words that you have spoken here today you are magnificent and glorious you have all dominion and all power and all wisdom reside in you god and we recognize that today We give you praise and honor and glory in this house for you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. Come on, let's give him praise. Let's just take a few seconds and clap our hands and yell out, shout out, praise him for who he is. worthy amen Amen. so worthy man it is so awesome when we get into his presence and just the peace of his presence the power of his presence the the calmness of his presence just all all the things 
all of the good things because all good things come from him, right? Amen. Amen. Well, before you take a seat this morning, we want to have a little bit of fun. Is it okay if we have fun in church this morning? Amen. You guys look so awesome. You guys aren't, you guys don't want to have fun? <laughs> Man, first service wanted to have fun. Second service doesn't want to have fun. What is going on here? You guys look so awesome in your, your t-shirts, your legal least likely. I'm so excited to look out there and see all of you wearing them. We want to do a selfie Sunday. So grab, grab your phone and uh, start to take pictures, do selfies, grab another League of the Least Likely person and take a snap of a picture with them. Those of you that are joining us online, we don't want you to be left out. Make sure that you snap a picture of yourself too and post it on social media and with the hashtag, hashtag TFH Selfie Sunday. Let's have fun. taking selfies with our fellow League of the Least Likely members. How many of you are in the League of the Least Likely? I am, I know you are too, and aren't you glad that God uses the least likely? Well, today is your first day with us. We are so excited that you came today. Look, you came on an awesome Sunday. You came on Selfie Sunday, so that's fun. If you could do us a favor and in the seat back in front of you, there is a connection card. If you would fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable with, we would love to get um, we would love to get connected with you. So um, even if you have um, already filled out a connection card, but maybe you haven't filled one out in a really long time, we want you to fill one out too, so that again, so we can stay connected. There you go. See, you guys are smart. We want to stay connected. But if you will, if it's, your, if it's your first day here and you filled out your connection card, don't drop it in the generosity bucket on your way out today. We want you to take it to the new here, start here table out in the front foyer because we have some gifts that we want to give to you today just for coming to the Father's house. We want to honor you today. So make sure that you get your gifts on the way out. Where's all my techie people in the house? Are there any techie people in second service? Well, remember, you have the e-guide at your fingertips that you can go to. Maybe you've never used it. Maybe you want to try it out today. Um, you can see all of those things that are on the screen with the click of a button on your smart device. So make sure that you check that out. I love it that I get to be a part of this community, this uh, generous community, that community, the Father's House, that loves to give and lives to give. Man, I'm so... I. I just, I, I'm so overwhelmed um, anytime that we get the opportunity to give and that you guys just answer the call and you give and you're, the, the, the offering that you give is just so impactful in our community um, for people um, all over the place, not just in our community here, but all over the world. And I want you to know that in the next couple of months, we're going to be highlighting something different every single week so that you know exactly where your um, offering, where your your seed of your money is going, um, that, that is going out there and flourishing and growing. And we want you to know that and be a part of that. So remember the tithe is 10%. That's what God has told us that we're to give back. It's all his anyway, but he has asked that we give him the 10% back and above and beyond that is our offering. If you're not prepared to do that today, that's okay. We have an offering envelope that's in the seat back in front of you. If you want to take that home, you're more than welcome to do that. It's self or it's um, postage paid. So you can just drop that back in and it's all taken care of for you. But we've got a lot of stuff going on around here. Always, always have lots of stuff going on. Not just to do stuff, just to do stuff, but because we know that community is important. So we have all these different opportunities that we get to get connected together to deepen relationships. And one of those is dogs for dads. Um, now, I just want to ease every single parent's mind in the room. We are not giving away puppies. Okay, 
I know some of you might like to have one, but there's some of us out there that are like, if you have puppies here and I have to take one of those home, I'm not going to be happy. No, it's dog, dogs for dads, hot dogs, and not just dads, but everybody gets hot dogs on Father's Day because we want to honor um, the dads and we want to honor you as a family. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We've got a special guest speaker, Dr. Dwight Bain, will be in the house. If you've never heard Dr. Dwight speak, oh man, he's one of my favorite people that come and speak into this house. I love Dr. Dwight Bain, and uh, I know that you will too. So make sure that you grab your dad on a Sunday the 20th and come out to church and have a lot of fun. Now, ladies, Sisterhood Unstoppable Women's Conference is coming up in October. I know that seems a really, really long way away, but we're going to blink and it's going to be here before you know it. So make sure that you get registered for that. You do have to register for this particular event, and you can do that by um, texting the word sisterhood to the number on the screen. Make sure that you get the word out. Invite your sisters. Invite somebody that's never come before. Even if they've never come to the Father's house, invite them to this uh, sisterhood event, and you won't be sorry that you did. And one more thing, we've got uh, next week is First Wednesday. First Wednesday is coming up and uh, I cannot wait. It's one of my favorite times of the month. First Wednesday that we get to come here together. We get to uh, stay in worship just a little bit longer and always, always, always hear a powerful, powerful word. So make sure that you come out Wednesday, seven o'clock and don't be late. Now today is the last installment of League of the Least Likely and I cannot wait for you. I've already been privileged to hear this word for first service. I can't wait for you to hear it in this service. It's going to be powerful and impactful. So get your notes out, get your Bible, and let's get ready for this week's League of the Least Likely. Wow, what a great, great time of worship, wasn't it? Man, let's give our worship team a hand. Thank God, thank God for them. Thank God, thank God, thank God. We're so glad that you're watching online today, and we're looking forward to the time that you can be back with us in the house. So we're going to finish out our League of the Least Likely, start a brand new series uh, next week, but also Wednesday night. I know maybe some of you uh, haven't been on a Wednesday night. Let me encourage you, come Wednesday night. I have a special word from the Lord. The Lord has given me a fresh word that I want to share with you. So if you can be here Wednesday night, that would really be be really awesome. I think you would enjoy it. All right. You have your Bible, you have your phone, your iPad, whatever you have. Let's hold it up together and let's say it. This is my Bible. It is the word of God. It is life to me. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for loving us and caring for us. God, we just praise you with all of our heart. Thank you for the great worship. Thank you for what you're going to say to us today. Lord, all these things that I will say right now are nothing without your anointing. And so I just pray, Lord, right now that you will anoint today in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I don't mind you filming, but could you take that, pic that uh, the light off? It's like blinding me. Thank you so much. Uh, that really helps. Batman and Robin were camping out in the desert, and uh, they set up their tent, and they were asleep. Some later, some hours later, Batman wakes his faithful friend Robin, and he says, tell me, what do you see? And Robin looks up in the sky and he says, I see millions of stars. Well, Batman <laughs> says to Robin, well, what does that mean? Well, astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Chronologically, it appears to be approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, it's evident the Lord is all powerful and we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it means that we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it mean to you, Batman? Batman is silent for a moment and then replies, Robin, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> See, you can be a superhero and not really smart. 
I mean, we've been looking at that in the last several weeks as we've looked apart. And remember, just we talked about, of course, Jesus is very smart, the legal least likely. But then we said David, the skinny armed sheep herder, Shamgar, the unconventional deliverer, Abigail and Mordecai, the unseen heroes, Ehud, the left hand assassin, Rahab, the believing unbeliever, Deborah and Barak, the unlikely duet, Jephthah, rejected deliverer. Sound like a good chapter for a book to me. And so here's our verses that we've been looking at. Read them with me. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hallowed pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by by blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate, a fresh start, comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. So today we want to talk about the judge that gets more chapters written about him than any of the others. We'll talk about Samson, the weak hero. Samson has four chapters in the book of Judges written about him. And when I read the story of Samson, it reminds me of me. Now, not, not how you think, not that, that I was that strong that I could take and tear down uh, the city wall and carry it out, but it reminds me of me because Samson's greatest problem was himself. His problem wasn't Delilah, just like today. Our problem is not who you're blaming. Our problem today is not the president. Our problem today is not the media. The media can't control you. How can they control you? No. It's me. It's me. How do I react? How do I respond? You see, Samson didn't lack the strength to be who God designed him to be, but his weaknesses sabotaged his anointing. It's really not how we start, but it's how we what? Finish. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said this. I love it. Great is the art of beginning, but greater is the art of ending. How are you ending? I think some of us, when we look back on our life, we say things like this. How many times? Why? Why did I have to do that again? Why did I have to mess up again? Why did I have to have the last word again? Why did I have to choose that response? Why couldn't I control my temptation? Why couldn't I control that lust of the flesh? Why am I so impatient? Now, ladies, when you read the story of Samson, I don't want you to feel like you can be left out. Because really, the story of Samson is not about a man, but it's about a people, a people and their response and what's going on in their life, because it's about the nation of Israel, and it's about those of us that are Christians. So we read, opening up in Judges chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. I know we thought that they would finally snap out of this, but they don't snap out of it. And here it says, and again... The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Remember, every sin has a consequence. Now, it's been 40 years. Now, there was a certain man from Zorah and his family of the Danites, whose name is Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said, Indeed, now you're barren and you have borne no children. But you shall conceive and bear a son. Underline that. Remember that as we'll tie that together because you remember the story again of a woman that's going to conceive a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child should be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel. Underline that. I've got it underlined for you, but be sure you underline that. He shall begin to deliver Israel. He shall do what? Begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. A couple of things I noticed that's different with uh, Samson. First of all, he's a judge 
that was promised to be a deliverer before he was born. All the other judges we've studied, the people were, were in trouble and difficulty, and God looked around, and he raised up somebody from the league of the least likely. But here was Samson. Before he was ever born, God said, he's going to be the deliverer. He's going to be this judge. And uh, second of all, uh, we look at this, and we see that the people didn't cry out for deliverance. Now, 40 years they've been in bondage. They got used to where they were. Just like if we're not careful, after we keep sinning and sinning and failing and failing and failing, we get to the place that, well, I guess that's the status quo. I guess I'll never get any better. I guess I'll never get out of this. And then thirdly, this young man was to take a Nazarite vow. Now, if you had the Nazarite vow, it was an external thing that showed an internal consecration or separation that you had to God. First of all, here's what it meant. You couldn't cut your hair during the vow. Second of all, you can't drink anything from the vine. That means no alcoholic beverages, no Cabernet, no Coronas, no Stellas, no Miller Lite. Did I catch yours yet? Or even Welch's unfermented grape juice. You couldn't have any of those. Thirdly, you couldn't eat anything that was unclean or touch anything that was dead, a carcass. So let me tell you the story. Once upon a time in a faraway land many, many years ago, God raised up a superhero from birth. He gave him strength to overcome the enemy. He didn't look like a super, superhero because everybody was always trying to find out what is the source of your strength. I mean, if he looked like a superhero, you know, bulging biceps that he scratched his head and his bicep would hit him in the mouth, you would say, oh, it's very noticeable that he's a strong man. But he didn't look strong. But all of a sudden, he could take a city gate wearing, weighing hundreds of pounds, tear it from the wall, and carry it to the top of the mountain. So everybody's always asking, and you'll see it in the very downfall of, why are you strong? Why are you strong? It's not, it's not how you look, but, but there's something about you. You see, the world can't judge the greatness of God in you. And they're saying, how can you do that? How can you be so joyful? How can you go through a storm like that? How can you do that? I don't understand that because it's what's working inside of you, right? So here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to frame our study. During this study, there's going to be several dangers that he, he has. And so right before I give you a danger, you're going to listen for this sound. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. No, Will Robinson. Danger. Yeah, for some of you that were uh, a little older like me, you remember the old black and white lost in space. For some of you that didn't know that, you'll have to go back and watch. But there was the old uh, robot, and the old robot was always warning young Will that danger was happening around him. So today we have one point in our teaching, and here it is. Recognize the danger signs. Recognize the danger signs. Here's a danger sign. The first one is compromise. Write that into your notes there. Compromise. From the moment Samson entered into the narrative, his compromising begins to emerge. He shows glimmers of power and potential, but all too often you'll find he did what was right in his own eyes, what he wanted, what he wanted. In chapter 14, verse 1, we read this verse. Now, Samson went down to Timnah. When I say down to Timnah, I don't mean that he just went down to a Philistine city that was south geographically, but I mean when he went to Timnah, he went down spiritually. He began to compromise and do what God didn't want him to do. So he looked at a woman there as a Philistine that he wanted to marry. Now, that means that he was compromising something that God had spoken to them in 1 Kings. God said, don't intermarry with pagans, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. I guess that's why the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Because if you marry an unbeliever on Sunday morning, you say it's time to go to church. The unbeliever says, heck no, I'm not going to church. So now your kids are going to learn two languages. 
Should go to church? Heck no, I'm not going. Which one are they going to listen to? And so we live in this and we create this thing because we compromise in what we think, oh, I can win them to the Lord. I can do all of that sort of stuff. And so now you're setting in chaos because your children don't speak the same language that you speak. Chapter 14, verse 2. So he went up and he told his mom and dad, I've seen a woman in Timnah and she's ooh la la. I want you to go get her for me. That's how they did it back then. The parents would have to secure the wedding. The parents say, no, please, Sammy, don't do that. Listen to us. Listen to your dad. That's not going to be good. It's not going to turn out good for your life. But listen to the spoiled brat. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what you say. She's the one. She looks right in my eyes. Woo. So his parents give in. They give in to the spoiled brat like some of you give in to your spoiled kids. I better not go there. So they're going down to Timnah, but somehow Samson gets separated from his parents and he walks through a vineyard. Now I've just said, he can't even be near Welch's unfermented grape juice. And now he compromised and I'm going to go through the vineyard. So when he goes through the vineyard, a lion roars and tries to attack him. Chapter 14, verse 6, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as he would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he didn't tell his father and mother what he had done. Can you say, wow? wow. Tear a lion apart with his hands. Now, look at the rest of that. Here's what I'm saying, like a young goat. So is this something you practice all the time? If you, is this like the Summer Olympics? You grab the front of a goat, somebody else grabs the back of a goat, and we pull them apart? Well, I actually looked, and even in Arab countries today, when they began to butcher, that's one of the things they do. Wow. So a few days later, he goes home, then he comes back, and he passes through, and he, he wants to say, I wonder about that carcass of the lion. So what does he do? He compromises again, back to the vineyard. And when he gets to where the lion is, the lion is there and he's partly deteriorated. And inside the carcass of the lion is a bee's hive. Now, isn't that a strange place for a bee's hive? In the middle of something dead, there's something that looks so good and tastes so good when you sample it. But wasn't that a picture of some of you today, the destruction that you're experiencing right now? You've taken hold of something you knew it didn't look right. It was in a wrong place, but it looked good to the eye. So he grabs some honey, and he eats it as he's going through, and when he gives to his parents, he gives them some of those. When I look at this, here's what I see about Samson. He thinks that the rules don't apply to him. What well, can this hurt? A little honey from a dead carcass? I just walked through the vineyard. God didn't strike me dead. God didn't get me. I was, so what harm is it if I do this? But what if it is that it's not God actually strikes you down at the moment of compromise, but by little and little as you compromise, you grow colder and more distant from his presence. What about you? Do you ever feel like that some of God's laws are above, or you are above them? I know that may be good for somebody else, but it doesn't really apply to me. That's just old fashioned. Integrity. Not following porn? Why? Well, I'll read a little, I'll, I'll watch a little porn. It'll help me in my marriage. What? Having a fling? That won't hurt nobody. Nobody. Everybody does that. Remember this that when you compromise, there's a consequence. May not immediately. But what if it happens at the height of when you had, should have been having the best of your life? Right. Right. And all of a sudden, it's destruction. So now they have a party, a pre wedding party. It's basically a seven-day beer party. Again, compromising again. They had a custom uh, that uh, you as a groom would have 30 groomsmen, and you'd have a seven-day beer party. So here is Samson, and he says to the 30 comrades, as they're all getting wasted a little bit, he says, hey, I'm going to give you a riddle. You've got to read the rest of this. I can't deal with everything today. I'm going to give you a riddle, and it's about... He, in his mind, he thinks the honey and the lion, the carcass and all that. And if you figure it out in seven days, the seven-day party, 
If you figured out, I'll give every one of you, I'll give you 30 suits of clothes. Each one of you, I'll give you a suit of clothes. But if you can't figure it out, then you, all 30 of you have to give me 30 suits of clothes. How about it? He said, yeah, no problem. We've got it. So all week long, they're trying to figure it out. They can't figure it out. So they go to his bride-to-be and they say, listen, you better find the answer. Go, we're not going to give him 30 sets of clothes. You find the answer. And if you don't find the answer, we're going to kill you and we're going to kill your parents. So she whines. Oh, Sammy, please tell me the answer. Who am I? I'm your wife-to-be. Can't you trust me with it? Come on, Sammy, tell me. I haven't even told my parents. She said, oh, but please tell me. So he says, okay, he breaks down. I'll take compromising again. Not worried about the consequences. So he tells her. And then right on the last day before the festivities are over, the guys come and say, we know the answer to your riddle. You need to go home and read it today. I mean, Samson is ticked off. Look at chapter 14, verse 8. And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have been able to solve the riddle. Wow. Now listen, first of all, guys, don't call your wife or your fiance a heifer. All right. But he's furious. And so he goes 30 miles away and he finds 30 Philistines. He kills them. He steals their clothes and he takes the clothes back and he throws them down and says, here's your 30 sets of clothes. And he didn't stay for the wedding. He took his parents and he said, let's go home. And they went back home. Well, now the bride-to-be, her father, says, we just had a ceremony getting ready to have it. What are we going to do? So I know I'll give you to the best man. So she marries the best man. Here's what you got to realize. You're free to choose, but you're not free from the consequences of your choice. Proverbs 14, 12 through 13 says, there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. Look again, it leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all the laughter will end in heartbreak. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. No, Will Robinson. Danger. Compromise. The second danger signal that he should have seen and stopped at any time. Think about, think about what his life would be like if he stopped at one of the danger signs. Don't, don't do it. Don't go any farther. I mean, how awesome would it have been if his life changed in a different direction? The next compromise is impulsiveness, entitlement. I deserve that, honey. I want that woman. I'm awesome. I'll take what I want. Throughout his life, you see him giving in to the impulsiveness of his passion. He sees a hot chick, he's going to take her. He gets hungry, he's going to eat that. Here's something we all have to realize. You cannot be desire controlled and spirit led at the same time. You cannot be desire controlled and spirit led at the same time. You can't keep giving in to your impulsiveness over and over and over. Some of you have done that as parents. You just give in to the impulses of your eating. You eat whatever you want, whenever you want, and you have gained a few pounds. But it's not so much what's happened to you, but it's the pattern that you've set that is now being reproduced in your children. And so one of these days when you're older and you haven't taken care of yourself, and you're in the ICU unit, naked, st- stuck, stuff stuck everywhere to keep you alive. And you say, oh, I wish I'd have eaten better. I wish I'd have taken care of myself. But then when you turn around and see the very same thing reproduced in your children, why did I live a life of giving into my impulsiveness? And some of you have done the same way with committing adultery. Now you see some of those same patterns in your kids because they've seen the impulsiveness that you yield to. Well, when he's back home, he cools off and he grabs a lamb and he says, I'm going to go back and take my wife. So he goes back and said, I'm home. And her dad says, you're too late, Sammy. I've given you some. And he gets I mean, he's impulsive now, totally impulsive. What, I'm going I'm to make everybody pay. I'm going to make everybody pay because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. You didn't satisfy my flesh. Now I'm going to make everybody pay. 
So he goes out and he catches 300 foxes, or probably jackals is a better interpretation. And here's what he does. He ties them together in pairs, lights their tails on fire, and releases them into the cornfields and the wheat fields. That's Hebrew saying that he opened a can of whoop donkey on them. So they're getting upset. And now they bind him. And they're going to kill him. So they have bound him in ropes. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson. And he breaks those ropes. And he takes the jawbone of a donkey. And he kills a thousand men. Look, the Bible says in Judges 15, 16 from the King James. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, I've slain a thousand men. Now, Hebrew scholars say that when you look at this in the original language, the words actually rhymed. And so he created, he created a rap. Yeah, we're going to go there again. I'm going to give you another rap. Now, let me show it to you because I want you to see it. This is in Hebrew. The word donkey or ass is the word hamor. Heaps, he said, I loaded them up on heaps, is the word homer. So in Hebrew, even though it doesn't sound in English, in Hebrew, it would have sounded right. It was a rap after he had that victory. So I, so I knew you'd want to know what it really says. So here it is. With a jawbone of an ass, I piled them in an ass. With a jawbone of an ass, I had a blast. Jawbone drop. I was thinking about that this week. And when I look at that story, I think, how could a man risk the purpose and the destiny that God had him for him for a little taste of honey? Then I realize that happens to all of us a lot. We give in to our impulses. Controlling your impulsiveness will determine your success in life. I shared this with you before. It's called the marshmallow test. But in 1970 at Stanford University, they brought in and studied 1,000 kids over four decades. This is a long study, over four decades. And they gave them evaluation tests. They started them off by giving them a marshmallow test, brought them into a room, set them down, put a marshmallow in front of them, and said, you have a choice. You can eat that now, give in to your impulses, or if you'll wait till I come back in the room, I'll give you two. So Stanford University, others have done that since, but Stanford University studied a thousand kids, and they found that there was one factor that made a difference in their success 40 years later. It wasn't social class, it wasn't wealth, it wasn't their IQ, but it was their ability for impulse control at a very young age. Watch this video. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. <laughs> I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. <laughs> All right, so it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. 
Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. <laughs> How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need him. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Not those kids, that was a different one, but the original one from Stanford in the 70s. Followed those kids for 40 years. And the thing that made a difference in their success was that at a very young age, they learned how not to give in to their impulses. Proverbs 25 and 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, no, Will Robinson. Danger. So the danger signals compulse, compromise, impulsiveness, and the last one, pride. He was self-secure. Towing with temptation, he was proud. He assumed he had never lose his strength. And he never gave God glory for how the God helped him. And he felt entitled to take whatever he wanted. He toys with temptation. Now, you remember the story? Delilah, right? I'm not going to go into that. I encourage you to read that. But Delilah, he really liked her, thought she was awesome. He fell in love with Delilah. And she says, tell me, because the Philistines said, you know, we'll give you this amount of money or we're going to kill you and your family if you don't do this. Find the answer. So she tries and she, four different ways. She says, tell me, tell me, tell me. And he keeps playing a game and compromising until he finally, the scripture said that he told her and then he laid down his head in her lap and went to sleep. Thinking, any time before I've been able to just get up and go on with life. See, some of you, that's a story of your life. You've compromised, given in over and over, and you thought, it'll never faze me. I'll keep getting over this. But the wheels of the harvest of your compromise will eventually reap a harvest. There he is. And she said, as she shaved his head, the Philistines are upon you. Saddest verse, Samson rose as he always did before, ready to fight them, but he didn't realize he had lost the presence of the Lord till it was too late. Scripture says they gouged his eyes out. How they would have done that, they would have taken a hot poker iron, jabbed into his eyes and burned them, and then they would have literally taken a spoon and dug out his eyes. And now they lead him away because he's weak. And they make him grind wheat, just like you'd put a horse or a donkey. And so his life is going around in circles, grinding wheat, pushing the rock over and over and over. I wonder how many conversations he had with himself. If only... If only I'd have seen the danger signs and stopped. But see him round and round. 
The Bible doesn't tell us about the prayer that he prayed. But the Bible tells us this in verse 22. His hair began to grow again. Now he couldn't see it. He probably couldn't feel it. But maybe when he laid down one night, he rubbed his head and thought, my hair's growing back. Maybe God's not through with me. Maybe there's still a hope for me. You see, God's forgiveness can be immediate, but restoration takes longer for his hair to be restored. But listen to me, even in restoration, you're never back where you were before you failed. He doesn't get new eyes. He doesn't walk away from that from victory. You see, you can say, well, I'll compromise. Nobody will know. God will forgive me and I'll get over it. But there's some things that will, you can never be restored back. And you'll live with the consequences for the rest of your life. So he's grinding and his hair is growing longer. They forgot about the secret. And he's recommitting his life to the Lord. And then they bring him out and say, we want to look at you. We want to laugh at you because you're so, you're so, you, you did all these things to us. And Samson, with a little boy that's with him, says, and archaeologists have recently uncovered a temple in that area where there were two big wooden poles that left in the middle of that place. And he said to the little boy that was leading him around, put my hand on one, put my hand on the other, and let me rest. And then he prays a prayer to God. God, let me die living for you. Let me die paying back the Philistines. Lord, I realize it was your strength that's helped me. And he pushed that. And the wall came down. Now we look at that story. And then we're reminded of another story in the New Testament that said, Behold, a young virgin shall bring forth a son. And his name shall be called Jesus, the Messiah. Samson and Jesus we don't know much about their childhood, but we do know that as Samson was constantly in conflict with the Philistines with sin, Jesus was constantly in conflict with the sinful religious leaders. We know that they arrested Samson and they humiliated him. And we know that they arrested Jesus, beat him, persecuted him. We know that Samson in his death had more victory than he did in his life. And we also know that in Jesus' death, he conquered sin, hell, and the grave. He did more in his death than he did in his life. You see what Samson, remember the opening thing? Samson began to deliver. And one day, thousands of years later, a man by the name of Jesus delivered us so that we can be set free. So what's your next steps today? You see, I see myself in some of these. Here's your next steps. My next step is, first of all, admit it. I've got to admit that I'm being drawn away from God, that I've compromised, that, that my life is a, is a life of impulsiveness, that I've been very prideful. I, I thought I, I could do it all by myself. Second of all, we just simply need to do this. We need to uh, pray and ask God's forgiveness. Ask God's forgiveness. 1 John 1 and 9 says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And number three, we just have to be patient. Restoration may take a while, but we want to finish strong. And fourthly, trust God that even with our failures, we can be in the league of the least likely. See, God can take your scars. Well, you know, I, I had an affair or I, uh, I was an alcoholic or I was a druggie or something else. God can take your scars and he can use them for his glory. Now that may, be, may not be that you'll be how you were before you committed that, but he can take that and he can make that and use that. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, we come to you and we pray today. Thank you for letting us see the danger signals in Samson's life and how that you went out of your way to send the signals, danger. You can't keep going this way. 
And Lord, there may be somebody here today that they see some of those things in their life. And today, God, they're praying and saying, I don't want to continue on this path, but I want to see a reversal. I want to see it reversed. I don't want to live. I don't want to end out weak. I want to end out for God's glory. I don't want to come to the end and end out weak. If that's you, you say, you know what? I identify in this story. I identify, and there's some areas in my life when I need to admit and ask God to help me. Would you raise your hand right where you're sitting and let me see? Thank you. Others today. Hands going up all over. Those of you watching online. Yeah, there's some areas, <laughs> areas in my life. I, t- I can't keep going this way. C- can't keep going. I don't want to destroy my family, my kids, my life, my career. Let me pray for you today. Father, I pray for those that honestly raised their hand today and said, I see compromise in my life. I see impulsiveness. I see pride. And God, I admit it. I ask you to help me, strengthen me. Don't let me run the red lights. Don't let me run the danger signals. Let me stop right now and turn around before I lose my vision, before I'm in bondage, and before my life ends in tragedy. As we're still praying today, maybe there's someone here and you say, I've never invited Jesus into my heart and into my life. And I want to invite him into my heart and my life today. I want to lead you in a prayer. But to do that, I'd like for you to just raise your hand and make eye contact with me and say, Terry, that's me. I need you to lead me in prayer today. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Others today, that's me. That's me. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Others today, that's me. Those of you that are watching online, just lift your hand right where you are. Let me lead you in a prayer. Pray this prayer with me. Father God. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are Lord and you died for my sins. But on the third day, you rose again. As best as I know how, I want to serve you. Fill me with your spirit. Let me finish strong in your name, Jesus. Church, would you rejoice with me with those who prayed that prayer? Come on. Yes, Father's house, let's rejoice today. That's great. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim. I'm honored to be your freedom and care pastor today. And before we close out, I just want to encourage you, if you made that decision, if you are one of the ones that we just celebrated, we would like for you to take your connection card to our Next Steps wall. We have some tools that we want to put in your hand. We don't want to just send you out on this journey by yourself. We want to partner with you. If you made that decision at home, please text DECIDED to 352 329-2301 329-2301 and we'll put those same tools in your hand. You can always call us here at the church office and we want to partner with you. Thefathershouse.com is where you keep up with everything that's going on around here so please don't miss that. As you leave out today, we have generosity buckets at all of our exits. And remember, your change goes to help change the world. Hey, grab some invite cards on your way out. Invite somebody to church with you. Before we leave today, though, we do want to take a moment and remember why we celebrate Memorial Day. People have given their lives. Brave men and women gave their lives so that you and I could have freedom. Let's watch this.
Would you stand with me as we pray for the families of those that gave all? Heavenly Father, help us to remember that this weekend is more than just a barbecue. It's more than just a sale in a store. It is where we honor those that gave all, gave their lives so that we can stand here in total freedom today. So, Father, we pray for peace for families that mourn the loss of a loved one who said, I'll go, I'll give all so that you can be free. Remind us of that this week, Father God, as we honor first you, and then we honor those that have given all, and we pray for their families. So, church, today, as we leave out, I want to ask our prayer team to come down front. If you've got a need and you'd just like somebody to say, hey, would you pray with me? We're here for you. Say this with me, church. Let's go out strong today. We are leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus. We're going to do that three ways. We're going to love God, love people, make disciples. Have a great week. We love you. We'll see you Wednesday night.